Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Mike Carroll. I'm the director of the program. I'm the and this is the next in our series of uh, events about intellectual property at the Supreme Court. The program on information justice uh, hosts a series of events about uh, cutting edge topics in the field of intellectual property. Um, and we're, we're pleased to have some of the students and members of the bar uh, joining us today. Without further ado, I would like to introduce my colleague, Professor George Contreras, who will serve as moderator today um, and take us through sort of what the case is about and, and uh, ask folks how they thought the argument was going to go. And I also just want to uh, extend a personal note of thanks to our colleague, Professor Amanda Leiter, a Supreme Court clerk who will uh, and will give us maybe a sort of more uh, objective view from the court perspective about why they took this case and, you know, what, what's going on from a different perspective. So with that, Professor Contreras. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mike. I appreciate it. Um, and thank you all for joining us in our live studio audience and to those of you who are watching on the web. Um, this is a little bit loud. Hold on. I'll push this back a bit. Um, and also thank you to our panelists who uh, took the trouble to come out after what is undoubtedly an exhausting, grueling day um, at the court this morning. Um, all of us were there, uh, watched the proceedings, uh, but some were more involved than others. Um, so starting at my far right, I'd like to introduce our panelists. First, we have Paul Wolfson uh, from Wilmer Cutler Pickering Hale and Door here in Washington, uh, who uh, represents uh, the respondent in the case, Monsanto. Um, next to him, we have Mark Walters from Frommer, Lawrence, and Hogue in Seattle, Washington, representing the petitioner, Vernon Hugh Bowman. Uh, next to him is my colleague, Professor Amanda Leiter from the Washington College of Law. Um, next to her is uh, Scott McBride of McAndrews Held in Malloy from Chicago, uh, who is representing uh, Amici Curie, Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, and other similarly situated Parties, And then to my immediate right is Seth Greenstein of Constantine Cannon here in Washington, D.C., also for Amici Curie, uh, Automotive Aftermarket Industry Association, and others. So we really thank you all for coming and sharing your insights with us. What we thought we would do uh, is I can take just a few minutes to explain the background of the case, what's, uh, what's being, what was argued this morning before the court, and then uh, I'd really like to turn it over to our panelists. I'll ask some questions and uh, try to get a discussion going of how the argument went, what the justices seemed to be interested in, where they were headed with their questions, and uh, what we might expect um, within the next uh, few months uh, from, from the court. So the case, for those of you who are totally new to the area, uh, revolves around the doctrine of patent exhaustion. And this is not a new doctrine in the law. It has existed as a court-made doctrine, not statutory, but the Supreme Court and as early as 1873 in the famous Adams and Burke case, which is cited often in the briefs, um, created this doctrine which says that once a patented article is sold in the stream of commerce, the patent holder cannot collect royalties on it a second, a third, a fourth time. The, patentee, the patentee's rights are exhausted in that article. And the Adams and Burke case is the quintessential case about the Cambridge-based coffin maker who has authority to make and sell a patented coffin lid within a 10-mile radius of Boston, sells the coffin to an undertaker in Natick, Massachusetts, which is further than 10 miles from Boston, and the person with the exclusive patent rights um, sues and the court holds that he cannot sue this Natick undertaker for infringing the patent because the patent rights are exhausted after that very first sale. The patent holder is fully compensated by the first sale. So the problem today, uh, 140 or so years later, is that Neither the authors of the Patent Act in 1790 nor the Supreme Court in 1873 ever anticipated that there would be products that would replicate themselves, right, that would reproduce without human intervention. And that's something, of course, that the court questioned a little bit, but something like seeds, right? You plant them, they grow, and they create more seeds by themselves. And so today's case revolves around a product that Monsanto created, a highly effective herbicide sold under the brand name Roundup, um, used all around the world, uh, used extensively in the United States. 
um, to enable your food crops to grow after this herbicide is sprayed on the crops, you have to use seeds that are also modified in, in order to withstand Roundup. And these are called Roundup Ready seeds. Um, and they are patented, just as Roundup is. And the thing about seeds is that once you plant them, nature sort of takes over. They grow into plants. And as I said, they make more seeds. And you really can't stop this from happening. Um, but again, that's one of the things that's being uh, discussed in the case. So when uh, a farmer buys Roundup Ready seeds, they come with a license agreement. But the license agreement conveys limited rights, typically rights to plant the seeds. In a single planting, not to harvest the seeds for replanting or to sell them for replanting. Um, but in this case, and we can ask uh, Paul about this in particular, Farmers were allowed to sell the resulting seeds to grain elevators. And grain elevators have in the past sold seeds for use as animal feed, for use in food products that are made with soy, um, but often not planted. But Mr. Bowman, uh, who's the um, petitioner in this case, um, did purchase seeds from a grain elevator, planted them, um, with no contractual restrictions uh, requiring him not to. And then something not too surprising happened. The seeds grew. Uh, they were resistant to Roundup. And uh, that, um, that induced the, uh, the suit from Monsanto for patent infringement, uh, claiming that when Mr. Bowman grows this new crop of soybeans using the seed from the grain elevator, um, it is making a new infringing Product, Not the original product, the original seeds that were sold and then put in the grain elevator. I think uh, there's general acknowledgement that uh, there were the, the patent rights and those were exhausted. Those could be used certainly within the scope of the license agreement. But as Justice Breyer pointed out a couple of times today, there are secondary and tertiary generations of seeds that are created when the original seeds do their thing and grow and so forth. And those are new patented articles. And the Federal Circuit, the District Court, held that those new patented articles, when they are made uh, by, uh, by uh, Mr. Bowman or any other farmer, infringe Monsanto's patent. Um, Mr. Bowman has argued in response that the sale of the original seeds exhausted Monsanto's patent rights, not only in that original bag of seeds that uh, was bought by an anonymous farmer and then uh, grown, uh, the products of which were then put in the grain elevator, but every future generation of seeds as well um, patent rights were exhausted when the original bag was sold. And that's really the question that's before the Supreme Court, before the Supreme Court today is before them now. Um, and with that, uh, I uh, certainly stand to be corrected in my recitation of the facts by our counsel, but I'll, I'll turn first to, uh, to Paul Wilson, uh, who represented Monsanto, and, and ask, Really, just a, um, a factual question first, Paul, which is something that I, I know a number of people have wondered, which is why Monsanto allowed farmers to sell to the grain elevators without these restrictions in, in the first place? Uh, well, um, thank you. Uh, thank you, George. And first of all, thank you for inviting me on this panel, which is a great, uh, a very exciting opportunity. Um, let me step back for a minute and I say the, the one of the kind of interesting puzzles that's presented by this case and by cases similar to it that involve what um, some might call self-replicating technology, others might call, you know, massively replicable or readily replicable technology, which is how do you bring an invention to market which the, where there's, it seems very likely that the minute you do so, you will immediately put yourself out of business. Because if you have an invention that once it goes into the market can immediately be copied, um, you know, in, in soybeans when they're planted, it's somewhere from they yield 20 to 80 soybeans, you know, but you can extend it to any number of kind of inventions, to vaccines, to DVDs, to, you know, to what have you. And I think that the, you know, it is certainly true that um, the, there was a lot of debate about this in the court this morning. Well, have we really had a case like this? Are you asking for an exception? Is the other side asking for an exception, you know, uh, to, to, you know, to patent law? And I, I certainly think it is true that the court, you know, although you see kind of, you know, pointers in how the court would decide this case from its previous cases, I'll, I'll concede that the court has never really had a case exactly like this or, you know, and this is, 
this is kind of the you know the brand new world of, of our technology, right? Where and and um, so the puzzle for a patent law is you know. I mean, the question for patent law and the exhaustion doctrine here, as it is in all of the exhaustion cases, which is how are you going to arrive at an arrangement that allows an inventor to commercialize his invention and allows the invention to be used broadly, you know, by people who want to use it because Monsanto and other inventors, um, you know, they want their, they, you know, they want their inventions to be widely adopted, right, you know, but, um, you know, they, want, they don't want to keep it, they don't want to keep, keep to themselves, you know, and they, um, the invention, but uh, how do you do that in a way that has, um, you know, that won't uh, lead to the result that the inventor immediately loses control of its invention? And, uh, you know, you certainly see in the court's cases over the last century a kind of going back and forth over this, you know, um, as the court has kind of struggled with various... Uh, marketing, what's called various marketing mechanisms. You know, sometimes it's it's more lenient towards the inventor, sometimes it's less lenient, and it is sort of, I think the trends have generally followed some of the court's broader um, uh, attitudes toward intellectual property protection in general. In the you know in the 1940s, in in the Univis Lens case, which is one of the leading cases. You know, there you had sort of the kind of the, the points where the, where the court is very, I think, suspicious of. Very, very kind of pro antitrust enforcement, and very suspicious of, you know, what we'll call monopolies, and you know, or intellectual property enforcement, as you, as you might want it. And then, of course, as the as the court has, I think, sort of tended to reconsider that, it's some of its attitudes towards IP protection have changed as well. Now, so getting to you know Monsanto's objectives, I mean, Monsanto wants its invention to be widely adopted by farmers, right? And it is not, and when I'm saying Monsanto, I'm also, you know, there are other seed companies, you know, we, we could use, it could be a stand-in for any company. I mean, it wants the company to be, it wants the invention to be widely adopted by farmers, and it wants the invention to be sort of adopted into the customary channels of commerce. You know, um, and a company in the situation of Monsanto is not trying to sort of force, you know, is not trying to kind of force all of the business relations of agriculture to be rearranged. Now, there are some things, you know, that, that there were some things that were necessary um, for Monsanto to do in order to make sure that it could, um, you know, that the invention could be commercialized in a way that would, you know, be in line with giving inventors an incentive. Uh, among other things, it you know, required that farmers not replant their, you know, not replant their crop after, you know, after having harvested it, which is a, is a, uh, you know, custom that some farmers have done because, of course, um, you know, once you allow, once you allow somebody to kind of essentially to reproduce your invention, you essentially are putting your customer in competition with yourself and nobody, and there is no possible way that you could, Recoup your investment by charging in the very first the, the sale of the very first bag, um, an amount equal to your, your ability to recoup your entire investment. So the idea is, rather than charge farmers, you know, ten gazillion dollars the first, you know, per bag of seed when they buy the bag of seed, you will you will farmers will come back each year buy a buy buy new seed and pay. A you know royalty a technology fee that is the equivalent to basically makes the uh, makes the invention available to them and also gives everybody else the opportunity to make it um, commercially feasible. Now, why does Monsanto allow farmers to sell um, soybeans to the grain elevator? Because that's what farmers have always done. In other words, mm -hmm. that's how farmers take their you know take their product the market. The farmer takes his soybeans to the grain elevator and, you know, the grain elevator buys it and then the grain elevator sells it to the agricultural processor and, you know, we're talking about huge rail cars that come up to the grain elevator and just, you know, they have a dump of rail car full load of, of soybeans and they go on to be processed and they go on to be, you know, tofu and soy sauce and, and so forth. So, you know, I mean, Monsanto or, and other companies, they are trying to kind of fit themselves into not work, not work against 
customary channels of commerce. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, that's an important point, you know, to, under, to understand here. Nobody is trying to say, you know, no, people are not trying to be punitive to farmers or to other processors and say, we're going to make life as difficult for you as possible. People are trying to sort of facilitate the invention being a, adopted as widely as possible and being adopted by channels of commerce, but in a way that is consistent with uh, the inventor's ability to, um, you know, enjoy mm-hmm. the profits of its invention. Yeah, great. No, thanks. That, that's yeah. really helpful. So it was uh, an interesting argument, and the justices seemed uh, very engaged. It was a lively uh, a lively uh, session this morning. What, but what do you think the justices were most concerned about in their questions? I mean, they seem to have a pretty good handle on the facts. What? So, I mean, I definitely think... Um, you know, you definitely have concerns that have been raised in a number of different for, uh, venues, which is what about the the unintentional infringer? You mm-hmm. know, this is this is something that Justice Kagan asked a question directly, you know, directed to this, and you you see this, you know, you, you see that this is a matter of some discussion generally, which is you know, given that given that uh, patent infringement is a strict liability tort, what happens if it's not really an issue with soybeans, but what happens if somebody plant so a farmer plants Roundup Ready, um, you know, seeds and the pollen, or you know, flows into another farmer's seeds, and then all of a sudden, is that farmer going to find himself to be, you know, the target of an infringement, you know, sued by Monsanto? So then there is the other thing that was I definitely heard a concern about, which is what about the fact that you know. Grain elevators commingle all their, you know, commingle their products. It's not, you know, it's not customary for them to, um, you know, to, to separate them by who, who brought them to the grain elevator. So, given that that's the case, you know, isn't it going to be inevitable that whatever you buy from the grain elevator, there will be some patented and some non-patented seed in there? So, if somebody buys non-patented seed and doesn't want patented seed, you know, aren't they? Aren't you sort of you're kind of forcing them to infringe the patent. So these are, you know, I think these are the, these are concerns that we had expected to hear, you know, from the court. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, they definitely did come up. Then, um, and I can, you know, discuss them, or, you know, we can do that later. But, um, you know, I definitely, you know, then there are kind of, as, as folks who studied the case will, will know, the case involved not just issues relating to, um, technology like seeds, but there were also questions about broader, broader issues about whether you can essentially buy a license or sort of buy a, sort of a conditional sale, sort of stop the uh, you know stop the exhaustion op- doctrine from operating, and you know the court did not see. I, I mean, I don't think that the court seemed as focused on that as I thought they might have been, but that was obviously that's obviously a concern that's there, and I know that yeah. there's a concern that Seth. Greenstein was very concerned about it. We'll speak up and out quite vocally. So. I, I, I will come back to Seth on that one. But, but I noticed I, that at least I think Justice uh, Sotomayor and Justice yeah. Maywood, it was Kagan, mentioned the uh, conditional sale doctrine, which uh, is not technically before the court, perhaps, but, uh, but they seem to be fishing for some reason to say something about it. Well, I mean, so... You know, a lot of people here have probably studied the court's decision in Quanta, which came out, I think, four or five years ago, in which the court wrestled with a lot of the issues about whether you can have anything called a conditional sale and how that sort of, how that gets put together with the, with the exhaustion doctrine. And I definitely think that the, you know, Quanta, I mean, it depends on how you read Quanta. You know, we don't read Quanta as having kind of definitively resolved a, a lot of these issues. Other people, I know, take a, a strongly different view. Whatever, whatever thing you take, whatever point of view you take about it, I think that Quanta leaves a lot of business unfinished, you know, for the Supreme Court um, to, con- to consider that issue. And so I think that there was uncertainty in the court about how much, how, how relevant that doctrine was or how that concept is to it and how, how much they have to engage in it, you know, in, in this particular case. You know, we thought uh, not at all well, but we told the Supreme Court not at all when we filed our opposition to the – well, first of all, talk about a humbling experience. Mark here filed his cert petition. Well, you know, we immediately said – we immediately waived our right to respond to the cert petition. One day later, the Supreme Court issued an order that said, respond to his cert petition. So that was <laughs> that was kind of uh, worrisome. Then we filed this um, brief in opposition, which was set, told the court, 
Um, no, you know, nothing about the conditional sale doctrine here. This is all very straightforward. You know, they completely ignored us and asked the SG to file a brief. The SG filed a brief that said nothing about the conditional sale doctrine, you know, don't worry about it. And then they went and granted the case. So, you know, um, uh, we, you know, that suggests to me that there is a substantial portion of the court that is interested in the conditional sale doctrine mm -hmm. and, um, you know, wants to address it, but it doesn't, but it doesn't necessarily persuade me that the court is going to do that in this case. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll have to see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we'll find out. It's interesting. Okay. Well, 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 let me turn next to Mark Walters, who uh, represents uh, Vernon Bowman, the, uh, the petitioner in the case. And, um, you know, I, I wanted to ask you, Mark, so, so a number of the questions that were directed to you were really around, you know, what's the implication really of this case for farmers, for agriculture? Does, does Mr. Uh, Bowman, you know, is he representative of, um, of farmers? And what are the implications of, of the case? And, and uh, what did you think about that? Well, I mean, I feel like uh, there were a lot of tough questions uh, asked of me today, and uh, I was trying to figure out, you know, who are my uh, who are my friends on this panel? Right now? <laughs> <laughs> uh -oh. It's like a, you know, somebody wanted to take. Okay, uh, you know, somebody. Let's see here. Can you? Is this better? Okay. Obviously, you know, at least four of them wanted to take the case, and. Uh, and so I was hoping to go in there uh, and, and, you know, to find, you know, who my people were up there. And uh, <laughs> I was searching and uh, I thought I had Breyer at least, but given his, uh, you know, questioning in, in like the Kirstan case, for example. And uh, so I was a, a little surprised uh, by that. But, um, you know, the, there are, you know, legitimate concerns about um, exhaustion and self-replicating technologies. And you have this new... Uh, you, you have new concerns for inventors about how we're going to commercialize the invention. I think the key question is, is it better to do it under patent law or is it better to do it under contract law? We obviously take the position that contract law is better, it provides notice uh, to people, and, um, you know, you get rid of the innocent infringer problem. Um, and also, you know, we, I think our case is a, is a really good illustration of somebody who had sort of a reliance expectation interest when he went to the grain elevator and he's like surely Monsanto can't claim to own the the grain in the grain elevator I mean it's just so mixed up it's got everybody's seed in there they can't and this is you know who would really want to plant this anyway um, they can't claim to own this and, but you know he was surprised by that so you have an example of a consumer who developed you know you might say rightly or wrongly a particular expectation based on the way markets work and uh, was surprised by the fact that, well, I can't do something with these things that I paid value for. Um, and, and so I think that, that the big question is, you know, is it better to do this under contract law or, you know, or, or patent law? And um, I think they're thinking about that. Um, and, uh, you know, I noticed some heads nodding, at least towards the end, um, you know, but but we'll see. You know, I think it's uh, it was obviously my first time <coughs> arguing uh, in front of the court, and um, so I mean I'm certainly not an expert like like uh, Paul and his firm is, and and uh, this has just been a, a kind of a wild uh, ride for us, and uh, <laughs> it's been a lot of fun too. Uh, you know, to get to know uh, Mr. Bowman, and he's a character. Um, uh, he answers the phone all the time with. You got the right number, <laughs> but uh, you know it was. Uh, <laughs> you didn't have caller ID either. I don't know how he knows that. You know, it's been interesting though, um, you know, just to go go through the whole process. And obviously, when we lost at the federal circuit, um, I remember thinking. We were contacted by the Federal Circuit Bar Association and said, you know, this is pro se. He's, it's been fully briefed uh, by this guy pro se. He's against Monsanto and very capable lawyers. Would you guys consider taking it? And I'm like, you know, I'm all over this. You know, this is like I went to an ag college. Uh, I worked in a seed lab for the Department of Agriculture. And uh, I thought, you know, this is going to be a perfect uh, fun case for me to, you know, to take up and, you know, get another argument. And I never thought, you know, 
you go to the Supreme Court, but um, <laughs> I remember thinking that when I started looking at the merits of it, thinking, you know, we're, if we're going to win at all, it's going to have to be at the Supreme Court because, you know, the Federal Circuit's case law was, was, mm -hmm. was pretty clearly against us. And then when we lost, uh, I thought, well, you know, Maybe, I thought for maybe a second to petition for rehearing, but, you know, like, that's not worth it. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Supreme Court, here we come. And then, um, you know, the judgment really, that's the, I think, one of the reasons maybe why they took it. Um, and this is something that we pointed out in our supplemental brief was just that, you know, the, the arguments below were really, were really focused on, you know, this is unlawful use of the technology. So, you know, you, Mr. Bowman, you went to the Grand Elevator and you used our technology without authorization. And so the royalty was based on how many acres he planted. And the only way you can really come to a conclusion that he doesn't have a right to use seeds that he bought on the open market is through the conditional sale doctrine. So we pointed that out. And But like you saw today, if they rule for Monsanto, they don't really need, you know, they can just rule for Monsanto without really... Mm -hmm. passing on the conditional sale doctrine, although I think they want to. You know, they want to, like, say something about it. And they want to say, you know, Federal Circuit, there's no conditional sale doctrine, but Monsanto, you win. You, know, you, so. you, you got the sense that they were itching to say something. Yeah. 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 So, I don't know. We'll see what happens. Um, it was certainly a um, good experience. And then we've got some of our people on our legal team here. Dario Mocklight, uh, here's an associate in the Seattle office who worked uh, really hard on the cert petition. And then John Herstoff, uh, who's uh, um, one of our associates in the New York office. So we're really happy to be here, and uh, thanks for thanks for having us. Great, absolutely. No, it's it's our pleasure. Thank you, thank you all for coming out. So, um, so great. So, so with that, so so then let me uh, turn to my colleague uh, Amanda Leiter, who uh, was a clerk on the court um, and and does follow these things to some degree. And we're, we were together at the uh, the argument this morning. I mean, I mean, what you know, as an outsider, as a non-patent person, as the non-patent person on this panel, um, what did it seem to you that the court was was thinking? Where did you, what what do you think the temperature was of the court? Where were the justices coming from? And the question is, well, what were your impressions of what went on this morning? Um, well, you started this off by saying I could give everybody insight into why the case was granted, and I would say uh, I, I had no insight at the start of the day, and I have less insight now. <laughs> um, because uh, from the very first question, the Chief Justice seemed uh, to agree with the basic argument that the exhaustion doctrine, when applied to a self-replicating technology, really destroys or undermines, at least, the uh, central function of the patent, which is to incentivize innovation. Um, and, and that was, uh, sorry, the tenor of uh, a lot of the questions, I think. Um, so two things that I think never got sort of fully vetted in the argument or that the court was never fully satisfied with, one really on either side, um, they were wrestling with respect to Bowman's argument. They never seemed to fully understand the point that with respect to what Justice Breyer kept calling Generation One, uh, the, the initial seeds that you purchase, Monsanto's argument taken to its logical extent would mean that there's really, I mean, you purchase this package of seeds, I gather, not being a farmer myself, you purchase these package of seeds with the intent to plant them, and Monsanto's argument essentially means that in the absence of some license or some modification of the terms of that sale, there's nothing you can do with those seeds, right? You're, as soon as you plant them and anything grows, the thing that grows is infringing. Um, and the court never seemed to get that. They kept wanting to talk about the, the sale of the seeds from the grain elevator, and they kept saying there are other uses you can make of those seeds, Right? You can, I don't know what, feed them to your pigs or do something else with them. But they never seemed to get that whatever they resolved with respect to that sale would also apply to the initial sale. And with the initial sale, the farmer's clear intent is to plant the seeds. And as soon as he plants them, he or she, uh, the, the plant that grows is an infringing product. Um, and they, the court somehow just never got its 
head wrapped around that issue, and I don't know whether they will. I mean, one thing I will say, sort of stepping back as a court watcher, is that you can't actually glean very much from the tenor of the court's questions because they are very well prepared ahead of oral argument. They come out sort of raring to go. Breyer derails them with a nonsensical hypothetical about something. In this case, it had to do with whether you could rob a bank with soybeans. I am not exaggerating. It came out in sentence number two. Can you rob a bank with soybeans? Or throw them in a child's face. Right. So they come out sort of raring to go, and they ask all sorts of questions, and they are prodding each other to some degree, and they already know a little bit because they've talked or their clerks have talked ahead about how people feel about the case and what are going to be the big issues. And they'll often get off on some tangent in oral argument that will give you the sense that it's going to be 9-0 in a particular direction. And then they get back, and they do their heavier thinking and analysis after the oral argument often. And sometimes you'll even have a draft opinion that, you know, gets almost all the way to completion, and then the phrase that gets used is, it doesn't write. It doesn't write that way. And sometimes until you've drafted most of the opinion, you don't realize that the argument just doesn't work. And so some of these things that they haven't fully grappled with, like what the outcome with respect to a grain elevator sale would mean with respect to the initial sale of a package of seeds whose sole purpose is planting, they may not wrestle with that until they get to writing the opinion. The other thing that I think they just weren't quite satisfied with and they couldn't figure out how to get to is this question about, and this is something that Paul raised, inadvertent infringement. And what does the ruling here mean for, just as Kagan hypothesized, the child who wants to plant edamame at home and grow, it's better than the bank robbery, plant edamame at home for a science project. She was then informed that edamame are actually underripe soybeans. You can't plant them. But anyway, I didn't know that. But anyway, that's the most fun thing for me at least about being a lawyer, for the students in the audience. It's so fun to learn the facts about individual cases. I mean, you learn so much about soybeans. But they really were wrestling with, okay, if the product, if this use of the product necessarily creates an infringing product, right, if every time you plant a soybean you are making a patented product, what does that mean for the poor kid who just, you know, grabs some soybeans out of a bag at home and plants them in a science fair project, right? Are they infringing the patent? And Seth Waxman, who argued for Monsanto, responded that the damages in that case wouldn't be very big. There would be infringement, but the damages wouldn't be sufficient. But I'm not sure the court is ultimately going to be, it wouldn't be sufficient, I should say, for Monsanto to go after that person. But I'm not sure the court is ultimately going to be fully satisfied with that. And at the end of the day, in my view, they were sort of wrestling with trying to find a middle ground, right? How do we incentivize this sort of invention without creating all of these unintentional infringers? And they may come out at the end of the day with the resolution that it is Congress that needs to find that middle ground. But, and that was an argument that Monsanto kept advancing. But note that Congress can find the middle ground from either end post, right? So it doesn't, if you think at the end of the day that Congress is the right body to find the solution, that doesn't tell you what the outcome of this case should be, in my view. Congress can get there from either outcome. The last thing I'll say very quickly is I teach environmental law here, and with my environmental hat on, I see some of my students in the audience. Monsanto sometimes is not well thought of in the environmental community. And there's concern about genetically modified organisms and things like that. And I would just say the patent doctrine or patent doctrines are a very blunt instrument with which to try to decide what we should or shouldn't do with respect to genetically modifying organisms. So 
you know, even if you think that some of what Monsanto is doing, it, it creates environmental risks, um, the, the right way to regulate that, in my view, is not by, uh, you know, torturing patent doctrines to try to disincentivize Monsanto in this case. Well, thank you. Those of us who study patent, I like to think of it as having a surgical procedure. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, just a, a difference of opinion. Well, so um, I, we would like to get a, a discussion going at some point. But first, we'd like to hear from our two uh, counsel representing Amicus Curie, who uh, who appeared in the case. Who uh, there were what twenty more than twenty Amicus submissions in this case drew a lot of attention from a broad range of uh, the community, both in industry and academia. And so we have, we're lucky to have with us uh, Scott McBride, who represents the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation and others, WARF. And WARF, for those of you who don't know, is famous for uh, stem cells, um, as being one of the primary commercializer of stem cell technology in this country. Um, and I guess the question, uh, the first question for you, Scott, is, you know, you don't represent uh, farmers. You don't represent uh, the agro business in any real sense with, with this group of uh, Amici. What is the interest of, of WARF and sort of the bio research community in, in this case? Sure, sure. Uh, by the way, Professor Contreras, thank you very much for having me. Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, the interest of the, un of the universities and, and academic institutions in this case deals with uh, protecting the value of existing patents and also to make sure that uh, technology in this area and biotechnology makes continues to make its way into the public hands. Um, the only way for, for that to happen is for the incentive to remain out there for companies to continue to invest in biotechnology. Um, in terms of just the background, to, to fully answer your question, uh, the, tech tra the technology transfer system um, was really highlighted by the 1980 Bayh-Dole Act. And what the Bayh-Dole Act did is it basically gave a vehicle for the universities to retain patents so that they could license the patents to private entities. And then those private entities have the incentive with the exclusive rights afforded by a patent to develop a product and also to develop a market for the product. Because it is significantly more expensive to conduct the development of a product than it is to conduct the basic research that, that may generate a product or ideas that are, that are ultimately put onto the market. Uh, so with academic institutions today, uh, over 50% of all basic research is done at academic institutions. That's, that is significant. And a significant percentage of that is in life sciences, which as we know uh, includes bi uh, biotechnology. Um, the numbers are staggering. Uh, but that is one reason for the interest. Prior to 1980, there were, it was just a somewhat of a mess. There were 25 different regimes for trying to get patents to the universities so that they could license them and get the technology into the public's hands. The key element of the bayh -Dole Act is to make sure that those technologies make their way to the public. Uh, so the bayh -Dole Act really completely changed the landscape. Patenting skyrocketed by academic institutions. Uh, the access by the public skyrocketed. Prior to 1980, less than 5% of all federally funded inventions, less than 5% were ma made their way into the public's hands in a, in a commercial product. Um, so the, the numbers after 1980 are just staggering. Um, so really, uh, I, th I think what, you know, what, what was spelled out in our brief uh, and was the concern of the universities was that, look, if you don't have the predictable patent rights, if you don't have, uh, you know, expectations that are continued to be met in this area, you may have an issue with companies wanting to invest in the future. Uh, you know, one of the studies that we've said in our brief pointed out that the expense for purposes of developing a product can be 10,000 times that of the basic research. Uh, now, that's, that may be at the extreme, but think about that. That's, that's an incredible investment. And if you're a private company, you're not going to invest that money unless you've got a good reason, unless you can get those exclusive rights so that you can adequately compete in the market. Um, so it, the interest then is in the, kind of the domino effect that, okay, if companies don't have the incentive to invest, then what happens? Well, then they're not going to do the work in that area. That biotechnology is not going to make its way into the public hands for the public benefit. 
uh, and eventually maybe some of the basic research in that area may dry up as well uh, just because the incentive is gone. Okay, that's some of the, that's some of the rationale. Um, and in terms of the case, I, um, I, I agree with Professor Leiter and, and uh, just to say that the Supreme Court did skip over that issue, and which, is, which may be one of the reasons why I took the case in the first place, which is, well, wait a second here. What is the case for that, that, that generation N plus 1, we'll call it? Generation N is the generation sold. Generation N plus 1 is the generation that the farmer uh, or customer makes on their land. Why can the, can the farmer make that generation? And what is the status of those seeds? And that is, I agree with Professor Leiter, that's something that the Supreme Court didn't seem to get their hands around today. It may be one of the main reasons the Supreme Court took the case. It may very well be that it's addressed in the ultimate opinion. Um, but that was interesting. And, and I think uh, one of the points that, um, that gave me some hope today uh, was just that ours was probably the only brief um, that didn't address, uh, I believe, did not address the Quanta case and also did not address the conditional sales doctrine. <laughs> so I can't tell you how happy I was to hear Justice Breyer then say that uh, this case has, quote, has nothing to do with the exhaustion doctrine. Close quote. <laughs> so interesting tidbits. Again, I'm not here to read the tea leaves, but uh, gave, you know, warmed my heart a little bit. Uh, and I just wanted to say thank you as well to uh, Stephen Wirth and Caroline Teichner, who are also here, they did the majority of the work on the brief and did an excellent job. Great. Well, thank you, and uh, thank you for, uh, for coming. So um, Amici, of course, appeared uh, sort of in both, uh, you know, both uh, sides of, of the case, and we also have Seth Greenstein here, um, who is representing another uh, industry group, um, the uh, Automotive Aftermarket Industry Association and, and others. And so, Seth, you know, we heard during the oral argument the justices and uh, the, the parties talk about implications for biotech. Uh, I think uh, vaccines were mentioned, and, and the connection isn't too hard to, uh, you know, to make between uh, self-replicating seeds and a self-replicating vaccine or stem cells or something like that. But, but even I, and I do a lot of high technology work. Even I, I am not seeing self-replicating automobiles yet. Um, what, what is what is your client's uh, interest in in this case? It's coming. It's coming. <laughs> uh, well, first let, let me be the last to thank you for having me here today. Um, and as Paul was mentioning, and, and as you were mentioning, yes, I, I, we filed a brief that uh, dealt with the less sexy aspect of this, but perhaps the more fundamental question. Uh, the concept of patent exhaustion is crucial to businesses like auto parts remanufacturers or imaging technology companies. That is, companies, for example, that take um, inkjet cartridges or toner cartridges, refill them, and resell them to you. All of these initially start their lives as patented products, but uh, then they have potential aftermarket life. Somebody can take them. You can buy a rebuilt engine. You can buy a recharged toner cartridge. And there's a doctrine that kind of goes hand in hand with the exhaustion doctrine, which is that of repair versus reconstruction, which says that if all you're doing is repairing a previously sold exhausted item, then there, the patent owner has no further rights in it. But if you're reconstructing the patent, that is, if you're rebuilding it, or in the case here, replicating, uh, which would be an issue in this case, then it's potentially infringement. Well, the rebuilders of engines, the rechargers of toner cartridges, all are involved on the reconstruct on the repair side of things, and that's been found in the courts repeatedly. But of course, the patent owner has uh, some business reason, uh, motivation to try to stifle competition in the aftermarket. And, you know, it's the old razor and razor blades model, right? You don't make your money selling the item the first time around. What you want is you want to be able to sell the consumable supplies over and over and over again. Uh, and so there was a case in the 1990s called Mallinckrodt versus Metapart. And in that case, the patent owner attempted to stifle the aftermarket in uh, inhalers that are used in medical devices. And what they did was they wrote on the side of it, after you purchased it, you saw this legend that said, for a single use only. And they argued that that was an enforceable patent license. And lo and behold, the Federal Circuit agreed. And it held that there was this doctrine, other than the patent exhaustion doctrine, called the doctrine of conditional sales. If you apply a condition at the time of the sale, 
well, then that condition supersedes to whatever extent the condition would hold the right of patent exhaustion and the consequences of exhaustion for the owner of that particular article. And it followed it in subsequent cases and embellished it to some reason or another. Well, I had a client named Static Control Components, and what they do is they help the remanufacturing industry for the recharging industry for toner cartridges. A particular printer manufacturer, Lexmark, started selling cartridges with a legend on it that said, this patented cartridge is licensed to you for a single use only. You know, after you're finished using it, return it to Lexmark for remanufacture or recycling. And they started suing all of the remanufacturers and my client that made the supplies for these rechargers. Just to show you the impact of how these decisions come down, the case started out in about 2002, and it's still going strong now. But it's gone through several phases. In the first phase, the district court found, well, you know, this Mallinckrodt line of cases from the Federal Circuit would say there's this conditional sales doctrine, and so Lexmark is entitled to assert this as a patent license, perfectly justifiable. Then the Supreme Court comes out with this decision in Quanta. And the court wrestles with it, has briefing, it has another round of oral argument even after the jury found in favor of my client, happily. And it said, well, you know, what Quanta says is that you can't assert post-sale conditions on use when you're making an authorized sale. And so, therefore, even though it didn't expressly overrule the Mallinckrodt doctrine, this conditional sales doctrine, it did so sub silencio. And then, of course, this case comes before the Supreme Court once again, and so we saw this as an opportunity to try to potentially put the nail in that coffin because Lexmark subsequently and the Federal Circuit subsequently keep citing Mallinckrodt in a favorable way. You know, they haven't held specifically and said the conditional sales doctrine continues to survive to this day, but they keep citing the case that keeps coming up insidiously over and over again. And so, so much so that the Sixth Circuit, when it recently heard an appeal on this issue in my case, in the static control case, said, you know, this issue is really too complicated, we don't have to reach it, and we're not going to. And so that's one of the reasons why we went to the Supreme Court here, to try to get an answer, finally, whether the conditional sales doctrine applies. And this issue keeps coming up in the most odd circumstances. For example, Kerrig, those of you who drink coffee probably know who Kerrig is. You know, they make those little, you know, one-time use cups, right? Well, a company came out with a refillable cup for that and was sued by Kerrig, and, you know, happily the court said no, the exhaustion doctrine applies, and you don't get to assert patent rights downstream. But our concern is that unless the Supreme Court takes this, decides it once and for all, it's going to come up again and again. Well, okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, and thanks to all of you for your comments. Now, what we'd like to do is open it up to questions. And first, I know we have a number of members of the press here, and so we thought we would like to let you go first if you identify yourselves or have questions, or if not, then we will open it up to the floor in... General. Okay. Oh, yes. I I will I will do my best uh, for that. I said, uh, Professor Gosher, did you uh, have a question? Yes. Sir. So, so let me repeat the question from Professor Shubert Ghosh. Um, that uh, the question is really, uh, what what is the definition of a what is the Supreme Court going to do about self-replicating technology? What is the definition, um, and is the Supreme Court going to be amenable to an exception to the um, exhaustion doctrine for these self-replicating technology, whatever they may be? Right, something something. 
panel? Any, any uh, hall? You see? Well, um, <laughs> although I may be responsible for introducing the, con the word <laughs> self-replicating technology, I wish I had never done this. <laughs> I, think, I mean, it's, it's, it's sensible to think about self-replicating technology in the sense uh, when what you're talking about is um, something that creates, you know, essentially an exact replica of itself, like a, you know, exact genetic replica uh, of itself, or, you know, it could be in software or, or, or anything similar. You know, it's not really self-replicating in the sense that, you know, human agency is necessary to, you know, to do the process of replication. Now, you know, the amount of human agency that is involved um, you know, may differ very substantially from technology to technology, right? I mean, you know, our point in this case was that, you know, when farmers are growing seeds and turning them into plants, which contain seeds that are the exact genetic replica of the seeds that they planted, you know, there's a lot of hard work that goes in there. You know, it's not just, you know, it isn't like Jack and the Beanstalk who, you know, <laughs> threw the beans in it and magically it, you know, it grew up, it grew into heaven. I mean, farmers, you know, that you have to, you know, plant, you know, determine when the right planting season is, fertilize water, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's always the case, I think, in, in you know, in the, in the modern world that, um, making an invention will involve some aspect of human, you know, human agency, but will also, you know, substantially involve some other kind of force, be it chemical or mechanical or biological. Now, the, the exact components of these things may differ substantially from technology to technology, but I think, but to me, I think, the point is that the rule should be the same if what you're talking about is, you know, affirmative voluntarily voluntary human conduct that causes um, causes a product to be replicated in some form or another. The way in which that actually happens, you know, there could be a million different ways. Mm -hmm. But you know, in my view, it really is essential. You really are in all of those circumstances making a new product, or making a new article that embodies the invention. Okay. Yeah. Others care to jump in? Or? You know, from, from our perspective, software just doesn't fit the model of a, of a self-replicating technology. I mean, it it is true that when you use a software invention that a copy gets loaded temporarily into memory, uh, and that happens. Uh, Congress did pass an exception for that. Uh, uh, so that could happen. But the, 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 when you use software, it's not about making copies of itself. And when you use a seed, the whole reason to use a seed is to make copies of itself. And then from our perspective, that's a self-replicating invention. Um, and and so I don't know if there's a way that they can actually, uh, you know, um, I mean, I'm, software just doesn't fit it at all from our perspective. Um, but I think that, uh, and I think some got that. I think I got a softball at the very end of the the, the, the argument in my rebuttal from, I think it was Chief Justice Roberts about, you know, is, does Microsoft really apply? Mm -hmm. I think he wanted to make sure I had a, a chance to say, no, it doesn't. And, and this isn't, you know, software isn't really a self-replicating invention. But, um, you, know, the, you know, the real concern is is, 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 is the invention centered around making copies of itself? And if you look at some of these other, like, you know, stem cells or something, I mean, those are treatments that go into people. And, you know, they're not going to, like, end up in progeny that, that can be sold by anybody. Um, but the whole point of, of, of practicing the invention of a seed is to plant it and to grow more seeds. And so that's a self-replicating invention. Um, and I think, hopefully, uh, they'll, and that's one way to cabin a ruling in our favor um, and to, to deal with some of the concerns uh, of, like, uh, biotech community. Um, I mean, obviously, uh, these things get replicated in, inside, but it's, it's part of the, the treatment, and they don't end up in, I mean, the point of the invention isn't to make copies of itself. I mean, that's, that's the point of an, an invention in seeds, and so that's a way, perhaps, to cabin a ruling in our favor. So, Okay. Anybody else have any comments? Or? Uh, sure. Um, uh, we didn't uh, fall in love with the term self, uh, no offense, it's self-replicating. Uh, we refer to it as artificial progenitive technology. Um, <laughs> We did. <laughs> that, just, that just trips off the tongue. <laughs> it seems 
it may not be easy to say, but <laughs> it seems to most accurately reflect what is happening. There is some human intervention, and the item itself is capable of generating progeny. Uh, the, the way in which it generates progeny is different. Um, the agricultural inventions are, are a little bit clearer. Uh, a couple point, examples we pointed to, uh, real-world examples from um, some of the amici were uh, potatoes as well as uh, citrus trees. We also pointed to uh, stem cells, uh, transgenic mice, uh, and other, other things capable of reproduction, um, you know, useful in many treatments, including a lot of treatments for cancer, which is, you know, one of the big reasons why this topic is very interesting today. Yeah, well, actually, there is uh, self-replicating software. It's a computer virus. So I, don't, I hope it's not patentable, and I certainly hope nobody gets a patent on uh, undoing the virus as in French. Okay. Um, oh, I just know, oh, sorry, ahead. I just want to jump in. The, 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 um, the, the court's concern is trying to figure out how important the human role has to be, right? Because these things do, in fact, seeds do, in fact, self replicate also, right? There doesn't have to be human agency for a seed to grow. Seeds, seeds were growing just fine before humans uh, <laughs> existed. So the, the human agency is necessary not for the seed to grow, but for there to be a defendant in the case, right? So, uh, <laughs> I mean, one way to achieve that result would be to graft on some sort of intent requirement. Here there would be clear intent because after Mr. Bowman purchased the seeds, he then sprayed his field with Roundup, right? So the, the, there seems to be intent to achieve this uh, protection against the effects of Roundup, um, I realize that that's, you know, that probably has to come from Congress. That's a that's that's probably too much of a stretch on existing. Not being a patent lawyer, I can't really speak to this, but too much of a stretch from existing doctrine. But that would be one way to get get in this issue of you know, did was there a human that was uh, complicit in in helping the self replicating technology self replicate. <laughs> Okay, fair enough. Um, I, saw, I saw some other hands here uh, on this side. Yeah, in, in the front? Yeah. yeah. Uh, my question is more related to, like, agrotech innovation. Uh, like, can you think about agrotech innovation as something that Monsanto has to do, like, sort of, like, bio, uh, like, they, they change the genes. And the classical form was always the breeding that they used to do with plants. So it was covered by the plant or production act. So my question is more in terms of, like, if you actually, like, work <coughs> utility patents or protecting plants instead of the plant variety protection that we had, which is obviously what they did in terms of like uh, the gem case, the Supreme Court did that. So if you're going to do that, what is going to happen to the cultivars that are, cultivars that are I mean, not being done? Like, uh, like for instance, like we had this banana cultivar called, uh, uh, what is that, Gross Michel or something like that. It was existing in the 1960s. And uh, we had this Panama disease, which, you know, totally devastated that particular plant in America. So we wouldn't even have had bananas at all uh, if, you know, we didn't find a different replacement. Mm. And mm -hmm. that particular replacement is what we eat today. And that's also being actually destroyed by the Panama virus, a virus or fungus rather. So if we don't have this cultivars which are being generated, which is prohibited by the Monsanto agreement, uh, which is relevant in this case, because without that particular breeds being come, which are being developed, I mean, often, uh, because the utility patent doesn't provide for those breeds, people actually go into monoculture. And because of monoculture, we could actually lose corn, or we could lose maize, or we could lose any of these particular things. And how does that actually like go in hand in hand with the policy of, you know, like the Supreme Court going ahead and granting utility patents? So this is a big issue that hasn't addressed, I mean, that hasn't been addressed at all. Right. So, so for the uh, television audience, the question is uh, around seed diversity. And, um, and, and whether uh, it's a, uh, well, beneficial or whether it's a problem in uh, limiting diversity of uh, seed types uh, through potentially uh, the patent laws in, in this way generally. I'll just take a, a first crack at that. Um, yeah, I think that is a concern and maybe one of the unintended consequences of granting utility patent protection on seeds is you've got a movement towards that and less of, of the breeding. But let me just also say 
uh, in response to some of the arguments that patents are, are necessary in order to drive, uh, you know, innovation in agriculture. I think the historical evidence in support of that is, is dubious at best. I mean, you've got a green revolution in the 1960s that fed a billion people worldwide uh, without patent protection, without even a PVPA statute. It was, you know, philanthropically funded and publicly funded, and 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 um, you know, uh, arguably. <laughs> if there were patents uh, around, it might, might have prevented the ability to have that real expansion in agriculture. And so this is the policy debate that to have at Congress. Um, and I think that there are some concerns. On the other hand, I don't want to sit here and say, you know, bash Monsanto and, you know, that's an easy thing to do, I think, uh, with the popular, you know, kind of uh, sentiment. I think that obviously my client wanted to use the technology and, and got a lot of benefit out of it. Um, and, uh, you know, he just didn't think he was infringing the patent. Uh, but uh, I think that there are some concerns uh, about shifting towards it, because there's just nothing that's going to be uh, PVPA protected only. Uh, you're going to have, it's all going towards, uh, you know, uh, utility patent protection, and that is very restrictive, uh, you know, for the farmers and what they can do with it. Obviously, what my client did I mean, I'd heard the arguments that it would violate the PVPA. That was surprising. You know, I think that what he, obviously it's, that's an argument saying that uh, you know he he would have been allowed if there was just PVPA protection. He could have saved his own single variety crop that he grew from Pioneer, and he would have been able to. That's a single, a way better seed source than going to the grain elevator. So how could that be a PVPA violation when he could have done something better by saving his own seeds? So. Congress, when they passed the PVPA, they had something in mind with, you know, this is what the, this is what it ought to look like for farmers and intellectual property protection on seeds. They ought to be able to save some seeds uh, to plant and then to resell those progeny. They can't get in the seed business and be in competition with the breeders, uh, but they can certainly uh, save some of their own seed that they buy and then sell that progeny. That's what the PVPA says. So, you know, I think that... Um, Congress uh, ought to look at this. Uh, certainly, if there's a ruling uh, in our favor, you know, Monsanto's got an adequate voice in Congress. Uh, you know, they're going to uh, get a hearing. And um, whereas I'm just because I've dealt with the farmers and trying to get amicus support and, and stuff, uh, they're not as well organized, you know, uh, as the biotech community and, and uh, the seed breeders and and, I, and I, it's doubtful whether they're they're going to really get a voice, uh, you know, in Congress. But it's it's trending that way, and I think it's a concern. But that's you know my my biased uh, jaded view. <laughs> okay. um, well, that. I disagree. <laughs> uh, um, I mean, I think I think it's perfectly I think it's perfectly consistent to have, you know, in particular patents on traits, and also to have seed diversity. I mean, you know, there are lots and lots of seed varieties that have the Roundup Ready trait in it. And I think that's a that's a fine model, right? I mean, um, in other words, you would, indeed you would expect there's so much variation in agricultural conditions throughout the country and the world that you would expect, you know, a develop a trait developer like Monsanto to want to have its, you know, its trait adopted in a kind of many different varieties that are suitable for, you know, all sorts of different soil conditions and climates and so forth. So, you know, um, I'm certainly not an expert on the PVPA, but I think that, the, you know, the PVPA has um, limitations on, <coughs> excuse me, the extent to which it can incentivize um, the kind of research and the kind of commercialization that are, you know, that although certainly not uncontroversial, have nonetheless, you know, been, you know, a lot of a lot of people at least see as enormously enormously beneficial, and I think it's I believe it is quite possible to pursue that path while still pursuing a path of of um, varietal diversity. Yeah. Okay. okay. I, I, I just think it's important to note that agricultural interests are are pretty well represented in Congress as well. I mean, the the size of our agricultural <coughs> subsidies alone uh, is evidence of that. So. That's the environmental lawyer coming <laughs> right, out again. Right, that's the environmental okay. lawyer coming out. Patent lawyers don't know about that stuff. A question in the back. The, 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 the question I have to the panel in general is for a moment to suspend the, out, the, the discussion of the case and fast forward regardless of the outcome, whether the court sides with Monsanto 
Or with Mr. Bowman, would any one of the panelists uh, venture uh, to hazard a guess how the jurisprudence of the European Patent Office is going to be affected by the outcome of this in the context of where the future lies for our country? Do we bias our industry or do we enhance it in the context of the European Patent Office jurisprudence? So the question uh, from the audience is what effect this ruling will have, whichever way it comes out, on the European Patent Office? <laughs> Anyone <laughs> guess? I'm not getting any. Uh, no. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. I'll just take a crack at it. Um, there was uh, that ruling about the uh, importing the the ground up meal into Europe, uh, and 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 the argument was, well, you can actually isolate the DNA from that, and then. Yeah, so this is still infringing because you, there's a patent on the DNA or the, 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 the genetics, but they don't allow the patents on the seed. Is that is that right? Yeah. Okay. I think you stated it correctly. Yeah. Um, well, I, I certainly, I mean, if you know, since we've allowed patents on seeds, you know, for since the 80s, and the European Patent Office hasn't followed suit, I don't expect that they'll do anything in response to this to this ruling. Um, you know, it's hard to say. I mean, in Europe, uh, there's a definitely a uh, there's there's more of a, a desire to keep the GMOs separate from the um, from the conventional seed sources, and and that could be a, a consequence of a ruling in our favor if Monsanto wants to you know regulate the sales of uh, or constrict or restrict the the, the sales. Uh, 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 from grain elevators, they would have to, of course, keep their seeds separate from the conventional. And, and, but I think that they probably don't care necessarily about people going to the grain elevator, and they probably care more about the intermixing of the of the seed. Uh, so to keep it swappable, uh, interchangeable, it's a it's a good business goal. Um, and uh, you know, our uh, our country hasn't uh, said that that they think that's a problem. Um, and certainly, that if, if you know if that was a problem, according to a popular you know when people they wanted that separate, they could go to Congress and and change that. I would assume. But for right now, it's uh, you know it, it's mixed here and and not there. And uh, I don't think that our a ruling in our favor would necessarily change it um, because I don't think Monsanto would care uh, about the grand grand elevator seed. They would probably care more about the keeping the mixing. That's my speculation. Thank you. Uh, question in the front? So I have a question. It's more directed for Mr. Wilson. It has two parts. Do you, uh, just as Breyer acknowledged that there are sort of several, at least three seeds here, sort of the N and plus one and plus two, do you believe that there can be exhaustion in seeds that go from a farmer that signs the tech agreement that he sells, he or she sells to the grain elevator and that end up in Mr. Bowman's hands, that there's exhaustion, except he can't make a new generation of those. I mean, I don't think those, to be clear, what we're talking about is, is there exhaustion in the, in, in, are the seeds that Mr. Bowman bought from the grain elevator exactly. exhausted? Assuming, right. Assuming that right. they really went sort of, you know, there's, they're not right. the 10th generation, they went straight, so they would be the second generation. Right. No, I don't think that those, I mean, I don't think that those, uh, that Monsanto's rights in those are exhausted either in the way that I think I, I sense that you're trying to talk about because when the when the farmer who bought <laughs> seeds from the seed store you know plants the seeds grows his soybeans uh, sells you know sells those soybeans at the grain elevator I mean that farmer has been authorized by Monsanto to do one thing which is to sell his you know, soybeans into customary commercial channels to, you know, for agricultural processing. But he is not authorized to replant them himself. He is not authorized to sell them to his, to give them to his neighbor to replant them. He is not authorized to sell them to his neighbor to replant them. And now let me also say, I don't think the court has to decide this issue in this case, but I've never, you know, but I've never understood what is so magic about the grain elevator. That is, if you can't plant something yourself, replant something yourself, and you can't sell it to your neighbor to replant something yourself, what is so magic about the fact that you sell something, sell your soybeans to the grain elevator, and then get back basically, you know, 
something identical from the grain elevator uh, that you then try to, try to replant it. I, I just don't see what what makes that kind of round trip through the grain elevator so magical. Um, and, um, and and not only do I find it not you know so important to me, I I see the opportunity for mischief you know in this in such an arrangement. So whereas I don't think that the case that the court has to decide the issue in the case. Um, I don't think that those. I don't think that that's really any different. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, I mean, with respect to those seeds, however, I mean, whether you say it's a condition in sort of on, in the tech agreement that binds that first farmer in terms of he can't do something, he can't sell for the purpose of doing something, you still don't believe. So that condition runs with the seed that kind of ends up in Mr. Bowman's hand. I mean, you you know, it, it seems to me it's a kind of fundamental premise. <laughs> of, you know, patent law and, and licensing, and maybe this does bleed into the conditional sale issue, but it is a fundamental aspect that you can't transfer to somebody else any more rights than you get yourself. <laughs> to, to me, that's a kind of a principle that we have, you know, throughout our law, but I realize that that's, you know, that's in some ways the issue in the case. Right. The, right. the professor, I don't mean to yeah. keep this going, but you mentioned Adam and Burke. Right. Doesn't that stand for the proposition that the licensee doesn't have the right to use there within a 10 mile radius, a buyer does have the right to use outside that 10 mile radius. So well, you I really have that exact restriction that I can't give any more than I have because Adam is that. I think there are other cases going in the other direction, you know, like Mitchell v. Hawley. So, um, you know, I mean, maybe the court will decide that. Okay. I just want to say one quick thing about the grain elevator seed. I mean, if it was such a good source of seed, like the round trip, then, then why did my client go uh, buy the pioneer seed every year for his first crop? I mean, that's to me is that's ironclad evidence that you know this seed in the grain elevator is junk. It's not something that is uh, really competitive with Monsanto's first generation seed, but. Well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> it may not be competitive until everybody else gets the same idea. Is the, is the is the point? I mean, I don't think I'm, I'm not saying that if what Mr. Bowman um, did here is is you know approved that like nobody will ever buy seed from a seed company ever again. Of course, that's not the case. I mean, farmers do want the newest, freshest seed varieties, uh, you know, every year. There are improvements made, I mean, well beyond Roundup Ready. I mean, they're, you know, seed companies are always making improvements in, in seeds. And, of course, you know, farmers are, are still going to want to keep doing that. But, you know, not everybody is, and a lot of people are going to think, I think, hey, you know, I can get this really great thing a, a lot cheaper, um, by going to the grain elevator, and you know, I think that as that, if that is a, a, um, you know, an arrangement that is you know normalized or given approval under the law, it'll you know, it's not going to be such junk, and what we're going to find is that it's uh, is that it's much more common, or if not just to the grain elevator, then you know, then I mean, obviously, depending on how the court would rule, it might be just farmers saving seed for their own, you know, for their own reuse the next year, or farmers just sort of. You know, selling seed to each other. You know, selling harvested you know soybeans mm -hmm. to each other for use of seed. So it's it seems to me it's very difficult to try to adopt a rule that basically says like you know one one time going to the grain elevator mm -hmm. is okay, but other things other things are not. I mean, you know, I can you know maybe the court might find a way of doing that, but I I don't see that such a rule would be stable. Right. Were you going to jump in on that? Sure. Or, uh, just one point, uh, Mr. Walters, you raised a good question, but uh, I, I'd say this. Uh, in response to wh why did Mr. Bowman not just buy the seed from the grain elevator operator for his first planting each year? Well, I think there's a straightforward answer, and that is I believe he began, according to the record, he began doing this in 1999. I don't think suit was filed in 2000, until 2007. So that's eight years of the process that he was going through with the second planting. Why did it take Monsanto so long to discover that, if that, in fact, is true, that it took eight years? Well, probably because Mr. Bowman continued to buy the same number of bags of seed each year for the first planting. So stop it not buying those bags of seeds each year at the start of the year would put Mr. Bowman on the radar for Monsanto, and, and I think probably would have gotten him sued a lot sooner. <laughs>
He was telling everybody what he was doing from day one. Uh, okay, he was like a coffee shop, and he was like, the Monsanto guys came to his house, and he was like, I've been planting the grain elevator seed. Do you have a problem with that? Because I, I, don't, I don't think there's a problem with that. I mean, my neighbors don't think there's a problem with that. He was not hiding anything. You know, that's just... Okay. You guys they can call, take that one out. He says, you got the right number. Yeah. <laughs> you, you guys take that one out to the cocktail. We'll have time for one more question. In, in the very back, the lady in the, the very back. That, that's you. Uh, just a, I'm just making a footnote so someone else can ask a profound question. Uh, I guess the footnote is that I think the reason grain elevators are so important is, you know, for those of us that don't know our local farmer, um, it's a 200-year history. And so if the grain elevator sold weird little grains of corn, people would go and buy it there. It's like a ritual, just like sharing equipment uh, in small farming communities uh, is also done pretty routinely in the uh, agricultural sector. So that's my footnote comment to uh, the gentleman who can't understand the ritual of a grain elevator. That's where it comes from. And they all go have coffee down in Virginia. So. Well, I'm sure I didn't understand the ritual of a grain elevator. What, I, what I'm... What I'm questioning is why um, why the intermediary of the grain elevator of, as a place where you buy soybeans that you want to use for planting makes it totally different from a situation where you replant your own soybeans, harvested soybeans, using them for seed, or if two farmers living next door to each other just you know, swap bags of seed. That, that's, my, that's my point. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. From the point of view of the court, though, the grain elevator is important because it enables the court to think in isolation about this question. If you purchase these seeds, which are patented, maybe, <laughs> from someone other than the patent holder who is not imposing any condition on the sale, what is what is the outcome of that? And it, it sort of gave them a, a way to tease apart these two questions mm -hmm. about the patent exhaustion on the one hand and conditional sale on the other. It's, it's kind of like a law school question. Right. Like it, it really is. It's a perfect we, typo. We, like, we, what we, if? So, so we, I think we have time. This gentleman in the blue tie has been trying for just one last question uh, to, to wrap it up. Um, for Mr. Wilson and uh, Mr. Walters, do you have any suggestions for avoiding the whole grain elevator? problem. Um, for example, if the claims were directed at the proteins um, that would uh, exhibit some desired characteristics such as herbicide resistance um, instead of the actual DNA sequence, um, do you think that may, do you have any advice, something like that, to avoid the green elevator problem? Yeah, I don't think there's a way to claim um, around the, the problem. Um, and the problem I'll define as somebody going to a grain elevator and uh, where Monsanto doesn't want them to do that and plant the seeds. For, so in the perspective of what we think Monsanto ought to do if they're really worried about the grain elevator seed is, is, to, is to require the farmers to sell the authorized grain elevators and then um, they require you know, their uh, buyers to say, I'm not going to plant. Um, uh, another way to do it is we put it in our brief, uh, you know, it was a, is an agency model where you could actually preserve patent rights all the way down the distribution chain by making the farmers agents instead of um, purchasers. Uh, they don't want to do that, obviously, and, um, but I mean, it, they have their reasons. Uh, but right, it's hard enough to step in. Yeah. <laughs> 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 So there's these two alternative worlds that are presented to Monsanto. One is that Monsanto should sort of like, you know, snare everybody in its web of contracts, which will like be out there throughout the world. So, if, you know, farmer, you can only sell to a green elevator who has a contract with Monsanto. Green elevator, you can only sell to a processor who has a contract with Monsanto. You know, processor, you can only sell to, or, you know, the rail car company has to have a, you know, a contract with Monsanto. The, you know, I mean, it's just, I mean... I mean, obviously, you know, exaggerate a little bit, but I mean, I, I don't see why it's better to have a world where, like, you know, you have this kind of vast universe of contracts with everybody, which are, like, impossible to keep track of, and heaven knows what the contractual remedies there are. The other idea that, Mons that like, Monsanto should just force all farmers to be its agents, I mean, I don't think that that's kind of very attractive to anybody, you know? I mean, the, uh, I mean why... why why compel that kind of really profound change in the relationship between, you know, two completely independent economic actors? I mean, farmers don't want to be agents of the seed company. You know, they want to be, 
you know, yeoman independent people who are, you know, who are kind of independent, you know, working on their own. So I don't, I mean, you know, whereas I understand, you know, the concerns that people have, I, I don't see why either of these alternative worlds is really, like, you know, the slightest bit better. And to me, they're a lot worse. You know, you already have half the contracts already out there with every single farmer, so there are fewer grain elevators. Should be pretty easy to get those. And then uh, with the uh, agency, I mean, farmers, they're taking all the risk right now with farming. Under the agency model, Monsanto assumes some of the risk with farming. I think they'll sign up for that. But, again, it's, it's just my view, jaded bias. Okay, well, <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much to, uh, to all of our panelists. Thank you.